If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask to turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 6. And uh, while you're turning, as always, I'm desirous of your prayers while I leave the church and try to preach what the Lord's given us. Gospel of Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Gospel of Luke chapter 6. Beginning in verse 12, the Bible says that it came to pass in those days that he, meaning Jesus, that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Amen. And when he and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon whom he also called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotus, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you to be before your people this morning. God, we pray that your presence may come down and that you'd see the import that we might see the importance in your word. God, pray that we would never, ever, Lord, let this word slip away from us, but that it would be our God, that it would be our pillow, that it would be what causes us to wake in the morning and give us the assurance to go sleep at night. Amen. We pray these things in the sweet, the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of scripture when the Lord Jesus was choosing his apostles. Now, uh, it's hard to imagine. First of all, I'll say this. I think it was an impossibility for Christ to be out of the will of God because he was God in the flesh. But we see time and time and time again that the Lord Jesus prays and prays and prays. In fact, he is the best teacher. If you want to really learn about prayer, you study the life of Christ. You study how he prayed, what he prayed for, and the end results. That, that, that is the prayer example in the Bible. And, and the biggest reason is, is he being part of the Godhead, humbly still went before God. And he, he prayed even, even though he knew what was going to happen. He subjected himself to prayer, and we need to every day, all the time. In verse 12, uh, as it's beginning to show the selection of the apostles, I want you to see that just before then, he had healed a man's lame arm. It was kind of contracted up against him and dried up. And he said, stretch forth thy hand, and it came out like this. Now, instead of rejoicing in that, the Sanhedrin began to get mad and angry, and they were ready to get giddy. Yeah. Now, when uh, you see the movement of God, don't you get mad. Uh, when the movement of God sometimes don't involve you at all and you're a little upset because you weren't the preacher or you weren't the singer or you weren't the teacher active in it, don't you get mad. That, that's jealousy. In fact, it's the worst brand of, be of jealousy you can find. But you just be satisfied that God has moved. And instead of being satisfied, they were very upset and angry with the Lord Jesus. Now in verse 12, the Bible says, And he came to pass in those days that he went into a mountain to pray. Now, I think this is a very unusual reading because time and time again, it will say he went up and up a mountain, up into the mountain. In fact, whenever he transformed himself before Peter, James, and John, they had climbed that mountain. Now, uh, and, and here, the interesting thing is that he went into a mountain. It didn't say he climbed it. He went into it. Now, the only thing that I can think of that that would be true is a cave. That's how you get into a mountain. Now, I don't know about y'all. When I was a kid, 
uh, being dumb most of the time, I enjoyed going into caves. Uh, I thought they were neat, and I would jump, I would, I would crawl into just small cave places to see what was back there. And I mean, it's just the grace of God I didn't find a rattlesnake when I got there. But never, never had any problems like that. But now I'll tell you about this: in a cave, if it's a deep cave, in a cave you cannot see and you cannot hear. Sometimes a wind will blow through a cave, sometimes it won't. So I want you to see what, what that really is, is a lack of distractions. Everything else put apart. Everything else set aside, and you're there with prayer. Now, so the first thing, if you want to be effectual in your prayer, and you want a prayer that's going to go uh, beyond, uh, beyond where, where you're abiding at, find a place of prayer. Now listen, this is my own opinion. You can't get a hold of God on Facebook. You can't get a hold of God in front of the TV. You can't get on a, a hold of God with constant distractions going on around you. You need to be in a silent place. Now, uh, I, I've never been, uh, I know Donna said that, she, that Sister Diana Jr. took her to Mammoth Cave when she was a kid and she just loved every minute of it. And, uh, uh, but uh, down under there, the way that I understand, they turned the lights out on you. And it's so dark you can't see anything this close to your face. Mm -hmm. You know what you have to do in a situation like that? Trust that your leader will get you out. That's your, that's your only option, right? It's just to trust that he's got enough sense and enough, and enough know-how about the landscape to get you out. And that's where we need to be. See, if we can't see what we think is best, then we have to depend on what God knows is best. And so what we need is the Lord's people. We need to find that silent, dark place and get a hold of God. Pray without ceasing. Now notice the next thing it says, and when it was, uh, and he continued, and he continued all night in prayer to God. Now, he got the worldly distractions away from him, and then it says that he prayed all night long. Now, there's not a person under the sound of my voice, and probably if this is broadcasted out, there won't be a person that can answer with much genuality, much truthfulness, that has spent their whole night in prayer. I've never had of you. I've never spent a whole night in prayer. So, have you ever wondered what did he pray for? Now, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ being the perfect example, we should always start our prayers off in praise. How wonderful and marvelous and great a God that we serve. That he's up on his throne, that he doeth whatever seemeth good unto himself, and what if, if whatever he does good unto himself, you know what? It's good for us too. A lot of people don't believe that, but I certainly do. It may not look like uh, it may not look rose and cherries on the top, but it's good for us because the Bible says this in Romans chapter uh, eight: all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, and for those that are called. Unto, by, by his purpose. And so, whatever happens is good. Can you praise the Lord for that this morning? Um, I mean, Donna was talking about the weather out here. Looks a little dreary. You know what? The Lord sent that weather to us, did he not? Uh, and, you know, Mama is in the house about all the time now. I don't, occasionally she might get out for a few minutes for church, but she pretty much confined her at home. And you know, uh, she made an uh, unusual statement, and she says it's supposed to rain. And she says, we really, really need some rain. And I said, well, Mama, how do you know that? She said, I've been watching the dust blow. See, if we take a minute to observe some things, we'd notice some things, wouldn't we? And, and in, the same, in the same way, we just need to trust God. When we go to him yeah. in prayer, just what, 
you know, and you know, if we get to the point that we no longer pray, we might as well give it up. Because listen, uh, that's our that's our that's our vehicle. That that is our means unto God. It's just to pray, just to go before Him and, and give Him great glory for exactly who He is and what He does. And so that's certainly what we should do. And then after this prayer, it says, And when it was day, he had prayed all night. He called unto him his disciples, meaning the great crowd. The best I understand, there were probably about 500. And uh, of them, he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he called, uh, whom, whom he also named Peter. Now, um, this uh, this listing of names, and you think about it, he prayed over him. He prayed that this, you know, he got he got understood that this would be one of them, and it would be the very one. It says, "I know not the man." See, praying will make you. Uh, understand God's will even when it hurts. The very one that would deny him three times and he would look at and says, Peter, before the clock grows three times, before the sun rises, the uh, you'll deny me thrice. And you know what? It's exactly happened. So he, he, he prayed for that and one of them was Simon Peter, the, the one that would later deny who he was. Andrew, his brother, the uh, and wasn't even that close to him. James and John, Philip and Bartholomew. You ever hear of the apostle Bartholomew? Except for here, it's very rare. You know what? I think Bartholomew and some of these others were just mediocre people filling up a slot. You know what? He knew when he called him there would be no epistle of Bartholomew. He knew when he called him that there would be no gospel of Bartholomew. He, and he still took him, and he still did it, and he still called him. So I want you to see, sometimes when we pray, it's not going to be extravagant. We're not going to get these big answers and this big, and, and this big bold over feeling every time. And what we have to do is accept the Lord's will. Just accept it. So he called all of them, including Judas Iscariot, and, 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 and he called them to the work that they had been given, uh, that they had been given to do. Now, if you will, I want you to look uh, with me in the Gospel of Matthew very quickly and just a little bit uh, separate accounting of the very same thing. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5, the Bible says this, These twelve Jesus sent them forth and commanded them, saying. Now a lot of people will say that they were gifted here, but the Bible says that they were commanded, that it was an order, that it was something that had to be done. That, that they had no option about. You know what? We live in a day and age today where we think everything is optional, don't we? You can come to church or you can't. You, you can stay at home or you can go to church. You can pray or you can forget about praying. But I want you to see here, it says these individuals were commanded, required. These 12, these 12 Jesus went forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles. So they weren't allowed to speak the gospel to anybody but a Jew. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to go and, and speak the gospel to any Gentiles whatsoever. Not, not, not the first one. And even the Samaritan woman, she was half breed and, and so she had Jewish blood flowing through her blood, her body as well. Go, into the, uh, go not into the ways of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. 
but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That, that was their message. You know, how many people today, and I've heard some, I'm, I'm sure, well-meaning preachers that says, well, I don't think Jesus is coming to this and this and this happens. Well, let me give you a newsflash, brethren. You don't know when Jesus is coming. In fact, if I understand the Bible like I think I do, he don't even know. You know, the, you know who knows? It's the person of the Almighty Father, Jehovah. He's the only one that knows. And when he says it's done, it's done. And Jesus, and then the, the trumpet will blow. And, and so we find here that uh, their, their message was that the kingdom of God was, was coming. The kingdom of God is on its way. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then they were given these, uh, these works. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. Now, you, you think about that just for a moment, and I picked that one because it seems an impossibility to the flesh. Uh, it seems an impossibility to, for my mind, little med medical training I have, it seems like an impossibility in my mind. That's an impossible thing to ask of me. Now, the other ones healed the sick. I thought, oh, yeah, I got that. But how are you, how are you going to raise the dead? Mm. Are you in tune enough with God to raise the dead? Now, I'll tell you what, how you get it done. Two things. you got to believe it can be done. you got to believe it can be done. And I understand the apostolic office is closed, so don't, don't throw me under the bus yet. But, I think effective prayer has the same the same premise. Believe it can be done and then ask for it. Believe it can be done and then ask for it. Uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the verse over in James. Uh, uh, he gives them instruction related to prayer and he says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, I've also always thought it was very unusual in the verses how, how it's arranged because it's exactly the opposite that men think. He says, The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, in my little understanding, it would be to me, well, the prayer of a righteous man is effective. But no, the, the effectual comes first. You know why? You have to believe that God can do it. In other words, it's, it's effective before it gets out of your mouth. It's effective and it's able before you even name it to him. So I ask you this as, as we're looking on into the matter of prayer, how effectual is yours? And we always measure effectual and use that verse, and I'm sure I have in my ministry as well, that we may measure effectual, effectualness from results. But according to my understanding of that verse now, the effectual becomes before the results. So do you believe it's going to happen, Jerry? Do you believe? Uh, and you know, you say, God believe what? Well, whatever do you have need in prayer, do you believe it's going to happen or do you not? Because that that is that is key for an effect effectual prayer life life. Now, if we will go me to uh first Kings. We're going to look at a man for a few minutes that had a very, a very effective prayer life, and the Lord used him greatly. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 38. 1 Kings chapter 18 in verse 38. The Bible says this, Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now all of you know this. This was whenever Elijah was up against uh, uh, 600 prophets of Baal. 
And, you know, and he even made fun of them. You know why they had an, in, in, an ineffective prayer life? Because they weren't praying to the God of the Bible. But you watch what Baal's servants do, and it's kind of impressive. In the flesh, I've never cut myself praying, have you? You know, here about a few years ago, I guess about uh, when my kids were teenagers, uh, they, you got into cutting yourself. I'm like, well, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Uh, but then when I talk about, you know, it kind of made me think back to the prophets of Baal. Uh, I believe that's the day we live in more so than what they were doing. And, and, and so we find then that this individual here, he, uh, he had prayed before this happened. Now, I want you to look at his prayer in verse 39. And when all the, uh, excuse me, in uh, verse 37 is his prayer, hear me, O Lord. Very simplistic. It wasn't going on and on and on. Hear me, O Lord. Uh, li listen to what I say. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou has turned their hearts uh, their hearts back again, then the fire of the Lord fell. Very simplistic prayer. Uh, didn't go on and on for days. But you know, if you'll read this, and you can read it this week in your spare time, Elijah did a lot of things to get prepared for this. In other words, that, that small prayer was only a piece of the faith that he had in God. Now, if you want a real prayer, just like he said, like he said in, in, in James, where the effectual prayer, if you if, if you want a good prayer life, you have to believe it. Do you do you believe God is able? Can He change the tide? Can He turn this nation in a different way? Certainly He can. Does He still save people? Yes, He does, and He can. We need an effectual prayer life. Now. The same chapter, go down to verse 41. Uh, verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is, there is a sound of, the, of a abundance of rain. Now, this is a very unusual statement because we'll see in a minute he gets down with Gehazi, and he sends Gehazi on these errands to look. But I want you to see before any of that happens, and the little cloud was about the size of a man's hand came across, before any of that happened, he says, I hear the abundance of rain. Now, what, what is the abundance of rain? It's not the sound of the rain. What's abundance about? It's what you get out of it. You, you, you know what makes grass to grow? Rain. You know why? You know why the tobacco on a certain year is good and a certain year it's bad? It's because of rain, the nurturing that we need. And you know what he what he was smelling was the effectiveness of God. In other words, he he believed it before he said it. And, and, and that's exactly what we as the Lord's people, and only you can judge, but when you go out before the Lord, is this the spirit that you go in? It, it, is this the, the sense that you come before God that already he's taking care of the problem and all you're doing is giving him praise? Uh, verse uh, 42, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel. Now, Carmel is a mountain, and I don't think it's any accident that he had to go to the top because it, you, you know what, and, and I can say it from having climbed one, when you're climbing a mountain, when you get to the top, you're wore out. You're about, that. this flesh has had it. I remember when I climbed that mountain, uh, I think it was Andrew that had brought uh, a Gatorade, and we all shared it. I, you know, other days I've been a little bit weary of, of sharing uh, a drink with three, two different people. One of them was my son, mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't like that when I married Donna. Now I'm scared to death to drink about that for somebody. She's taught me that. And uh, uh, 
But you know what? It's the best drink I ever had. And I didn't care if Andrew had spit in it. I didn't care if Matthew had spit in it because I was, thir I was thirsty. So that's the first thing. And, and I was wore out physically. In other words, Elijah had gotten the flesh out of the way. You know what the best thing to get the flesh out of the way? Just pound it as hard as you can. And so, um, with that done, on the top of Carmel, and up to the very top, he's sitting there, his flesh is out of the way, his servant is beside him, and notice what he does. And he casts himself upon, uh, down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Now, I don't know about you, Bella might could pull this one off, I don't know, she's pretty limber, but to put your face between your knees while you're lying down, that's no easy thing to do. Uh, again, I couldn't do it. I, and, and as I was in study, I was trying to think, how did he accomplish that? Because if he fell on the ground and then he put his head between his knees, it was almost like he was folded in half like this. How was that accomplished? You know how that was accomplished? He put his, uh, he put his sin aside. He put his flesh aside, and he got into a position of prayer. He totally got the flesh out of the way. He, he totally set that apart. And when he did, you know, uh, it didn't go boom, and everything happened. It wasn't snap, and it's all like he wants it to be. Now, notice what the Bible says. And he said, go, and he said to his servant, go up and look up toward the sea and he went up and looked and said there is nothing how many times have you prayed and that would pretty much wind it up there is nothing do not hear from God do not feel his presence see no effectiveness in what you think has been accomplished there is nothing Man, I've been there a lot of times when, when I felt like I'd wasted my time. When, when I was like, uh, this is it, I, I'm done, there's nothing, there's nothing else to be done. Then notice what it says. And he said, go again, seven times. Now a lot of people I think have this messed up because they'll say that he went and looked seven times. But the Bible says, he said, go again seven times. So to me, I think that prayer was done eight times. Because he said the first time, and then he said, go again seven other times. In other words, Gehazi looked up there until, until that last time, the eighth time, and he saw nothing. And you, if you remember Gehazi, he's the one that didn't trust God. Gehazi was the one that was the counterfeit. He went away. He wasn't like Elijah was unto Elisha and a faithful servant. He gave up on Elijah and not only that, Gehazi gave up on God. But can you imagine being to this servant of the pro this prophet of God being his servant and seeing this occur and get nothing from it. You know what? You know what those eight times were? They were faithfulness. Again and again and again. Laying it out before God. And I don't know what he said. I don't know. He said, Lord, we need some rain. Lord, we need some rain. Or if he says, Thou art glorious, thou art marvelous, you are above everything, because it doesn't record the prayer of Gehazi. I mean, excuse me, of Elijah. But it does record that he kept on praying. Now, the, the, the next thing in your prayer should be faithful to it. Just because you don't think anything has happened don't mean that it's not. You keep praying. You be, you be faithful to the very end of what, uh, of what this says for God's people to do. Notice what it says. And it came to pass on the seventh time that he says, Behold, there arises the little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down. 
the rain that the rain stopped thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black and cloud with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was, was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now we see that you know a lot of people will judge uh, the effectiveness by the amount of rain. And it certainly did rain. It came a gully washer. Mm -hmm. But I believe just as important is that old Elijah kept praying. He kept putting it before the Lord. He kept asking for intervention. He kept desiring that God might move with him. And that's exactly what happened. We, we as the Lord's people, uh, we need to arrange our prayer life in such a way that, that this is the anticipation and this flesh is put somehow under the problem. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 12. Second Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 6. Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 6. Now, there may be hindrance along your way in your time of prayer. Now, all of you know, because y'all been with me a long time, my prayers out loud, they're not much in, in man's eyes. Uh, I think to have a fervent, effectual prayer, it's between you and God. Now, there, there's nothing wrong with praying out loud. I don't have an issue with it. But at the same time, if you judge me and by that, it's pretty not much to it, right? Uh, and, and so we find in Paul's day, and he's writing to the second Corinthian, the second letter to the Corinthian church, notice what he uh, says in verse 10. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 and verse 10, uh, excuse me, verse 6, the Bible says, And though I would desire to glory, in other words, uh, Paul was acutely aware of his pride. He was acutely aware of what pride could do. He says, though, uh, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. In other words, to glory, to be happy in yourself, to say, look at what I've done, you're a fool, according to the Bible. For though I would desire to, to glory, I shall, I shall not be a fool, for I, will say, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above what he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And the least, and the lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, I think it's very interesting that Satan is mentioned here. He said, the messenger of Satan. Now we all have our little uh, our little cracks and crooks in this flesh, and body hurts, joints hurt. My knees been bothering me for two days, and you just have to kind of grunt to get going. You know what? That's not a messenger of Satan. We haven't seen that yet. But I want you to see that Paul had it identified exactly the source of his eyesight problem that Satan had sent it upon him. And I'm often thought of back in the days of Job where he says, uh, have you considered my servant Job? And you know all the problems that, that the devil asked permission to send along Job's way. And maybe he said, have you considered Paul? He's an effective preacher. He's getting the job done. He's spreading the gospel to Asia Minor. He is doing his job. <laughs> and the devil, have you, has Paul served you for naught? And he said, well, do what you, how about his eyesight? You take his eyesight from him. 
And you know what? Despite all that, Job continues to serve him. And, and, and so we see as the Lord's people, sometimes Satan can inhibit prayer. He can't inhibit what we're trying to do for Christ. If I understand this the way I think, I do. But notice it's through the flesh. You know what will take away from your prayer life is focusing on your flesh. You know what? There's not one of these person, people under the sound of my voice this morning that don't have some little something going on in their body right now. You know what? In a spiritual sense, all I can say is get over it. Right? And get on your knees before the Almighty. Because listen, if you sit there, oh, my knees hurt so bad. Oh, my back hurts so bad. I feel like I've been hit by a bus. You keep bemoaning. And I guarantee this, if nothing else, you won't have time for prayer. And so we find that Paul wasn't going to do that. Uh, verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice or three times that it might depart from me. Now, I thought that it was very interesting that he said I did it three times. And we don't know exactly how long after the, the second Corinthian letter came around, but I've heard it's estimated about seven to ten years later that he lost his eyesight on the road to Damascus. So you know what? What that tells me, every time he got down to prayer, he wasn't you know, I need to see again next day. I need to see again. Uh, my ministry could be a lot better if I could just see again. Only three times in ten years? That's remarkable, isn't it? Because the flesh being what the flesh is, and him knowing Christ like Paul did, it had been real easy. And, and, you know, why did he do it more? Well, maybe he was praying by priority. And he saw that that wasn't all that much of a problem. That there were people out in Thessalonica that needed to hear the gospel. That there was a Philippian church now because he had prayed there in the Philippian jail. Maybe having been able to see good, he saw, well, you know, in time and eternity, that's, that's not that important anyway. But he did, he did pray it on three separate occasions somewhere in that time span. This is what he says, and the Lord answered him. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so the next time you got the hummy grummies, listen, you somehow use that for prayer. You know, this is the thing about getting old. And me and Donna have been talking a little bit about that about late, lately and what we, a couple of things we like to do the house while we're still working. And, uh, because see, the day's coming when we're not going to be able to. Amen. Right. And, you know, this, and I used to not be like this at all. I used to get up on my work days and my off days just like a rat on decon. But yesterday, I noticed that I slept to about eight. And the Saturday before that, it was almost nine. And Donna, I heard Donna slipping around the room, and it woke me up then. And, and, and you see what I'm saying? This flesh uh, has issues. But you know what would have been a much better use of that time than kicking back and getting me a couple extra hours sleep? Is find some kind of dark place and get along with God and begin to pray. You know, as time passes by, and if I get in a situation where I can, would to God, instead of wasting a bunch of time, that I'd be able to pray before Him and, and use that time in a better way uh, than just spinning my wheels. All right, last place, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to close. And this is for you ladies, you sisters that are here this morning so that you don't feel left out. 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 10. 1 Samuel 1, uh, beginning in verse 10. Now, if you know what the context of this book is, it's concerning Hannah's prayer to the Lord. 
And Hannah had no children, and Penina made fun of her. Uh, you know what? If you have one little infirmity in the flesh, people are going to make fun of you. They're going to make fun of you because you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and, and Hannah's issue was she could not bear children. Uh, and her, it says her adversary, which was Penina, uh, Penina would come against her and say, I got a house full and you ain't got nothing. And, and, and would jeer her again and again. And she kind of got, she finally got in such a way she went before the Lord. Verse uh, 10. And she was in bitterness of soul. Now that's your best effective prayer that this soul within us gets in such a bad shape that we need prayer. That, that we are so heavy burdened for our children and our grandchildren that it's totally consuming to us and we can't think about anything else. That's the kind of burden we need. We need that kind of burden for New Testament church. We need that uh, kind of burden for missions. We need that kind of burden for people locally. And, and Hannah got it over one issue. You know, I, I think that's significant when we begin to think of, about prayer instead of taking and praying about missions in a generalized sense, won't we take one missionary and put him before God all the time in bitterness of soul? You know, uh, when Brother Downs was getting sick, and uh, I knew I knew he was getting bad. Uh, for a long time, I prayed for divine healing, and then I got to the point, and when I, when I was really bitter and so about him, I just prayed for his comfort, uh, because you know, um, I know one night he called Barry. And he said, Barry, could you come and get uh, me and your mama? So she, he, he, he was even confused on if that was Sue or Nancy. And he said, well, Daddy, where are you? Well, we're, we're over here in Paducah. And he says, no, Dad, you're on the other side of the world. You're in Thailand. And you know what? That's a pretty bill, bitter pill to swallow, ain't it? And Barry came and Barry called and told me. And after that point, all I wanted for Brother Downs was for him to be comfortable. Right. Uh, and so we find then that what Hannah was really wanting, uh, she was so burdened with, is the condition that, that we need to be in on a routine basis. Verse 11. And she bowed a bow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on my affliction, on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. And, Han and But now Hannah, she spoke in her heart only, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunk. Now, that's amazing to me that she was in search of a fervency of prayer that Eli thought she was drunk. Now, I'll give you two things. Number one, Eli was out of the will of God. You can look through his life again and again and again, and he was not a godly man. But she prayed so much she looked like she was drunk. You ever thought about, have I ever done that? I know I haven't. You may have, but I haven't. That, that you were so enthralled. And if you've been around very many drunk people, seemingly they just get fixated on one thing. And they talk about it and talk about it and you go, shut up. And they'll talk about it, and, they, and, and to the point, you just want to hit them. And uh, I believe that was why Hannah, I mean, why Eli thought Hannah was drunk, because she was fixated. You got fixated on anything lately, on your children, on your grandchildren, just fixated, and that's all that's consuming your thoughts, is you wanting them to be saved. See, that, that's the kind of prayer that we need. And you know the rest of the story? 
The Lord attended to her. She made a vow. Now, I personally don't think that there's a, a there's an issue with making vows unto the Lord. But let me say this. When you do, you better be sure you keep them. That's right. The only vow that I knowingly have ever took is I vowed to love Donna the rest of my days. That's the only vow I know I've ever taken. And we as the Lord's people uh, said, but Hannah meant it, didn't she? In fact, Hannah stuck to it. And she, and I don't know how long it was before those other children started coming along, but the Bible says that she went up there and, and made, uh, made uh, Samuel a new coat every year. So it may have been a number of years before finally, and here we find kind of that Nana has five other besides Samuel. And uh, but you see, she had always been faithful to her commitment. What about you? How's your prayer life? I mean, there's nothing in here, no, not one person that can look at you and say, "Oh, him or her's prayer, prayer, uh, prayer life." It's not where it should be, but you can. You uh, you can you can have that discernment if you say you can have a spiritual discernment about your own prayer life, and that's what you need. Uh, if you wanna, if you want some, if you want some good time, some good times in the Lord, pray. Uh, that's the only thing that I can give you advice on.